All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and welcome to uh, the second ever uh, Enterprise Roundtable. Uh, although this one is a one on one, but we don't like calling it webinar here, so we're just going to uh, stick with Roundtable. Uh, so, super excited today to uh, welcome um, one of the people I admire the most and a good friend of mine, Mr. John Cutler, uh, to the stage. So, uh, a quick word about jo uh, John. Uh, John is uh, currently a product coach and evangelist. Uh, at Amplitude, which is a very famous and leading product analytics company that I'm sure uh, all of you are aware of. Uh, uh, John has been there four years. Before this, John spent um, has spent uh, several years as a product manager and UX researcher at companies like uh, Pendo, Appfolio, uh, and Zendesk. Um, uh, but I think that, that's not what makes John special. Uh, what makes John special, and especially for this conversation, is like we're talking about product planning, uh, which is like very complex, and there's no one else, in my opinion, <laughs> at least, uh, on the planet who can uh, unpack complex topics on product planning uh, better than John Cutler can, uh, which is why he has this crazy following, <laughs> almost like revered following across the globe. Uh, so really excited to uh, welcome him uh, today on the stage uh, and have a discussion. Yeah, Hi, John. awesome to be here, Vern. It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah. good to see you. Uh, all right, uh, excited to dive into it. Uh, oh, by the way, sorry, before I dive into it, I would be completely remiss uh, if I did not introduce the entity. Uh, responsible for organized event, which is my employer uh, that I have the chance of serving as CEO, which is uh, Enterprint. Uh, so one one minute blurb about Enterprint before we dive into um, discussing product planning. Uh, so at Enterprint, we're building customer feedback intelligence for product development orgs. Uh, we're lucky to be backed by leading investors like Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia Capital. Uh, we came out of Stealth seven months ago, uh, and in the short time, we were lucky to have customers like uh, Notion, Ironclad, uh, Samsung, Airbase, uh, and several other companies, including my very famous globally adopted Decacons. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're curious about and want to leverage customer feedback to build better products, uh, check us out at enterprint.com or send us an email at namaste at enterprint.com and we'd be happy to show you what you're working on. Um, awesome. All right. With that out of the way, uh, let's dive into it. John, uh, so excited to have this chat uh, very timely around product planning with you. So let's dive into it. Um, I think the first thing, let's let's just identify what good and bad looks like, right? So let's, let's what, what are the signals of good product planning? Uh, and conversely, what are some clear signals of bad product planning and how can like teams identify that? Sure. Um, let's do some key signals of good product planning. Now, depending where you're at in the cycle, these can obviously vary, but I would say as you progress through the cycle, you get increasing amounts of clarity. And I'm not talking about simplicity, talking about clarity. <laughs> so what you're doing is you'll, you'll very, you, this is what you will observe. You will walk into meetings and whereas maybe five weeks ago or eight weeks ago, you could barely even um, have conversations about the direction you might be going. Um, now what you'll observe is shared language, mm -hmm. very crisp ideas. Um, people will use words that other people in the room understand. There'll be emerging ideas that there's some amount of convergence on. And there'll be what generally is known as coherence, right? So coherence doesn't mean that everyone agrees by any means. But coherence is that you understand what people are saying. You have a shared set of assumptions that you might be challenging or going along with. So this sounds like a, you know, throw your hands up in the air kind of thing. But this is exactly what you observe as product as the sort of annual planning, product planning process goes on when you're moving in the right direction. Now, mm. when you're moving in the wrong direction, what do you observe? People are getting increasingly fatigued. They're just saying F it. They're just nodding their head. Um, it becomes a sort of political game as people realize that mm. sort of budgets are at stake and things are happening. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting increasing simplicity without clarity. So what I mean by that mm. is people keep trying to simplify the strategy. So the classic one is, you know, three pillars or a four up quadrant or something like that. And th th those artifacts are not creating shared understanding. If anything, they're just confusing people more and more as you're working. Another thing is you start to notice that people are very much buckling down around their local agendas, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll start yep. to see people, um, you know, you know, this person is basically showing up at a meeting with all their list of things that they want to get done. And this person is follow, you know, showing up at this list with all those things. I'll leave you with one final thing too, is that one thing you observe when planning is not going well is the number of kind of, oh shit, what do you mean by that moments? 
you know, where you finally take mm. what you have and then expose it to a slightly larger group of people. And mm. everyone, it's not even, um, it's not productive amount of tension, right? It's unproductive mm. kind of, where did this come from? Why didn't I have any opportunity to provide any input on this? What mm. are you talking about? So I, I, that's the way that I frame it. And again, it seems very abstract, but it's not. What we're trying to do in this planning process is create increasing amounts of clarity Whereas maybe over the course of the quarter or the year, that clarity has drifted a little bit or it's become more implicit and more abstract. So mm. that's, the, that's the trick. If you're getting more clarity by every week, as opposed to sort of more whatever, you know, 2023, just screw it, just get your PowerPoints in or something like that. <laughs> like <laughs> that's how you know you're making progress. Yeah, no, I, I love that. So just to double click on one point you said, um, is coherence a precursor to entering, starting the product planning, or is it an outcome of the final product planning? Like, or, and conversely, is there a baseline amount of coherence you should have entering or starting, you know, whatever it is, like quarterly, biannual, or annual product planning? Yeah, I don't think it's a prerequisite because it's unreasonable to think that you will ever have full coherence in this particular thing. So I think that it's... Um, if you're not making progress towards it, that's a big warning sign. But so, for mm. example, if it's October and people, you know, this year has just been, this year especially, just a crazy year. There's a lot of, yep. you know, people have been working to deliver stuff and test stuff and run experiments. It's natural at that point that the organization will have sort of shifted a little bit tectonically. You know, that like yes. some, some parts of the org are thinking this and the other parts of the org are thinking that and people are doing mm. those things. So I don't think it's a prerequisite to start that particular process. I do think what's important is reiterating the vision and mission of the companies. Like if you can't yep. even clarify those core things, that's probably a signal that the, uh, the leadership team needs to really get that little nugget <laughs> set. Yeah. Because if you yeah. can't go into the meeting and even understand maybe what game you're playing or. Yep. what industry you're operating in or whether the core beliefs of the company have changed, that's going to make it very difficult from that point. But that's oh, what I'd say is yeah. that's the minimally viable coherence. Yeah. Do you understand kind of yeah. why you exist? Yes. Um, you know, what are the core beliefs and can you say them? That's a good test to start the meeting, yeah. I would say. <laughs> start yeah. the meetings as, yeah. as if yeah. it's only one meeting. Um, yeah, as if it's only one meeting. Yeah, yeah we wish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we wish. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> great. So I think I love that. On, on the topic of coherence and getting to clarity, I think um, unanimously what I've seen is like one, the multiple inputs that go into getting to the clarity and uh, one of the, you know, unanimously desired uh, inputs is customer feedback and voice of the customer. Like, hey, how do we leverage, how do we use that to prioritize what exactly decisions for uh, investments we're double down on, what we don't want to double down on. Um, so there's a desire to do that, but uh, but not a lot of teams are able to effectively do that, right? Like leverage voice right. of the customer in as an input in product planning and getting to clarity, right? So how, how do you do it effectively? How What have you seen work well uh, in leveraging yeah. voice of the customer in product planning? Well, I mean, this started in January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the point here is basically, if you do not have a continuous practice around feedback and voice of customer and putting these things into context, what tends to happen around this annual planning or product planning time is the absolute worst trap of recency bias. Whatever yeah. customers was yelling the loudest in, November, in October or September or, you know, whatever the trend you were seeing at this particular point, um, maybe sales is encountering a certain headwinds uh, at the particular moment. So you're going to hear a lot about that. And so what tends to happen is people just go hunting for what's going to support their strategy. They don't go with an open mind to the voice of customer. They go with like, well, you know, we're, we're moving into the enterprise. Therefore, I'm going to look at all the enterprise feedback and they completely forget that maybe enterprise is a fiction, you know, that they don't, you know, that there's other clusters that exist with there. So the number one thing you can do is build this practice around voice of customer and interpreting customer feedback earlier in the year to prevent recency bias and then prevent like selection bias or cherry picking the data to, to believe what you mean. The second yeah. thing you need to keep in mind is, is that I'm a big believer that as you start an initiative, a team should embark on doing research together and get very deep on a particular problem. That's not the same as keeping the pulse on the whole organization and the whole yes. bit of feedback. So what tends to happen is if that year you were focusing on X, you have a lot of research around X, 
but not Y, not Z, not A, not B, not C. And so you're very biased by the initiatives that have been happening. And then you get this kind of whiplash effect where the team is like, oh my God, we don't have any research actually on this other problem. Oh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Everyone go and yeah. you know, look, at, look at calls or do it very manually when you're beginning. And that's why you know, I like where your product fits into this particular part of the picture because you need to think of this as a muscle you're building all the time. And you also need to think about doing feature oriented or initiative or bet oriented research. So it's like the continuous hum and the initiative based at the same time. And if you do yeah. that correctly, you'll arrive at this time of year with some effective things. Now, so some very actionable things though, um, you know, one, one super important thing is you kind of also get crystal clear on the different, maybe, you know, your company might use personas or profiles or mm -hmm. segments or cohorts or anything. But if you haven't evolved a cohorting or segmentation strategy before planning, it's very, very difficult to be doing both at the same time. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to be, you know, thinking about who your ICP is and who all right. these things are while at the same time attempting to be able to form a strategy while at the same time being able to think about tactics to be able to influence that. So it kind of, that's part of the hum activity. You right. can't make strategy and persona development and profile development and segmentation as a once a year activity solely aligned with trying to pull a deck together or pull some planning document together. You need both in tandem. Now your voice of customer might help you evolve those profiles over the course of the year, but you just can't do all of that at once. I mean, this, this, is, this is why people get no work done for three months out of the year because they're trying to <laughs> do everything they should have been doing for the whole yeah. year in one quarter. Yeah, yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. So I think just to like summarize, I think what your take, the key takeaway I got is like you need to have like a baseline hum of the, the core input side, right? which is like voice of customer and emerging trends, persona development around that, um, and then yeah. once that basically needs to establish like clarity and baseline al alignment across all stakeholders, who can then enter, you know, with what what we talked about is like the minimum viable coherence uh, yeah. start and then end at clarity, you know, hopefully uh, in a couple of meetings after that or whatever, how much ever time it takes. Yeah. And the way to think about this is um, here, here's the tool I use and you can think about it by the quarter for the year. There's always drift. The team is always drifting away yep. and you can do things that are very heavy handed to keep everyone aligned, but that's typically expensive and you don't actually want full alignment. Yeah, because you don't get serendipity, you don't get innovation, you don't get other things when everyone is forced to align on every single thing they believe. You actually want to have things that are divergent. So unhealthy would be you go through the whole year like this. Now, mm. what happens in most companies by by the end of the quarter, everything is far apart and they barely bring it back a little bit. And then mm. the next quarter goes even further apart and they barely bring mm. it back in. A and then they bring very, very far apart and they bring it back in. And then you just jump into annual planning. So you could think of this if it helps visualizing it as there's a little bit of drift, bringing it back together. There's a little bit of drift, you're yep. bringing it back together. There's a little bit of drift. And so that's, I don't know if that helps people think about, like you don't want complete conformity. That would be dangerous. But at the same yes. time, you don't want this like annual mm -hmm. just by the, you know. And then the problem is by that is by September, people are like, screw it. I don't want to make any decisions anyway because everything's going to just change in four months. You actually yeah. get people make less good decisions after July because they feel that anything they do is a liability because it's going to get caught up in annual planning again. Mm -hmm. And that's terrible. We don't want that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. No, I, I love that. Yeah. Oh, by the way, folks can continue asking questions in the chat. Uh, we, we leave like about five to seven minutes at the end for audience questions. So uh, I personally don't want to just hog all the time. So I would love to hear, uh, yeah. please enter your questions and we, we bring bring them up on the screen as well. Um, I, I want to like switch gears slightly. I think um, I, this is like very topical, very real right now is um, product planning this year is going to be very different from any product planning, at least in the last decade, given uh, the very difficult macroeconomic headwinds, you know, especially in the technology sector as we continue to witness this year. Uh, how, how should teams adapt product planning uh, given given this environment this year, uh, something they haven't had to do in the past decade. So any, any, any thoughts on that, John? Yeah, I mean, I, first thing, it really matters now. It just can't be a political exercise. <laughs> Yeah. Right. You know, like I, I think realistically for these last 10 years, for a lot of companies, 
at ever. It's just there's a lot of tailwinds and things have just been working. So it really does matter at this particular point. Um, the next thing I think you need to think about is a, a horizon-based planning thing. So the way I use it very specifically is this ones and threes method that you can basically divide anything you're doing into ones and threes, one to three minutes, one to three days, one to three weeks, one to three months, one to three quarters, one to three years, and one to three decades. Everything you're doing at the company happens on those time scales in tandem automatically. So mm -hmm. you're showing up at this webinar for one to three uh, hours, <laughs> and this is connected to a one to three month bet to maybe you know learn about planning, et cetera. So it's yep. nested bets. So the number one thing that you need to think about if you have not done this already in your product organization is to get the cadences of each of those humming at the right point. Because there's, there's so much... Um, uh, unpredictability in the space now at the moment, if you think you're going to get away with just committing to a year's worth of stuff or a roadmap or a plan without building the muscle to think about your like one to three month calibration and one to three quarter calibration, um, you're going to have a lot of trouble. So the very actionable thing you should do is Yes, it's important to get some things lined up for your planning process for next year and some agreements and some things. But you need to kick off the motion for almost what's like a continuous planning process happening on like the one to three month time scale, because things are going to very quickly change and devolve as we go through these, you know, the next year or so to do it. So the way to think about this very practically is imagine your sort of annual planning cycle as this set of activities and then think about how to compress those into um, a shorter abbreviated calibration activity that you're going to just do on a more regular basis. So if you have, if you do not have that in place now at the moment, mm -hmm. if you're quarterly, you know, if your quarterly planning just amounts to just a uh, performance theater and you're not calibrating your beliefs and thinking of it almost as like a mini strategy, mini calibration mm -hmm. setting, you're going to have a lot of trouble next year if you didn't already have a lot of trouble this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a very important point. Um, I Would it, like, does it even make sense to do product, uh, annual product planning or like some companies do like multi-year planning uh, given the macroeconomic headwinds? Uh, well, here's here's my like... take on it. What, um, no, the problem is not annual planning. The problem is that's the only cadence that people are working on. Right. The yeah. problem is, is they look at annual planning and say, that was so hard. Therefore, we can only do it once a year. And I think mm. it was Martin Fowler who said, if something hurts, do it more often. Right. <laughs> right? So yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's just a sadistic activity. It's a sadistic yeah. activity, which is largely like performance theater in any company, these end of the year things. And the, the question is, can you do it differently? Yes. Some companies do. Some companies have a continuous planning process. Yes, there's a budgeting cycle, but that's interwoven into the other things that they're doing. There's a whole mm -hmm. movement called Beyond Budgeting, which talks about how to be much more adaptive with your budgeting process, even if you wanted to do that. So technically, is it possible to break out of this cycle? Yes. Do companies politically want to go there? No. There's a lot of like control involved and egos involved and all sorts of things involved in making it happen. But one thing, no matter what company you can do, is work within what you can control and start these more continuous calibration things just to make sure that you're not having that end of the year hit. That's going to happen yep. to do it. Yep. So would I, would I have an annual product planning process if I had a company of 500, 700 people? No. Um, it would just be more continuous. And the, the one at the end of the year would just have a, a small layer of budgeting layered on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the, on a similar topic, right? It's like uh, there's an element of like getting better at it over time and leveraging yeah. this activity and just like improving your time over time. Um, so let's say it's six months from now and companies are, <laughs> you know, ref reflecting on their, their biannual planning or the quarterly planning of last quarter or their annual product planning. Uh, outside of like a touchy feely thing, oh, I think it went well. I did not go well. <laughs> how how do you grade? How, how do you grade and how well you did on product planning? How do you is it able to quantify and measure the impact of how well yeah, you did? Yeah, I think you can. Well, well let's also discuss the prefer the perverse component here, which is six months from now, probably someone's going to tell you you need to start planning for twenty twenty four. So yeah. you're not even going to think about this. You're going to say, screw it. You know, I have to go back into doing this. But minus that. There's two elements. Was it the right planning and right strategy and right direction? And then is, did you, are you executing on the thing that you're doing? So just that distinction should be very helpful for people. Mm. To understand if it was the right strategy, one thing I've noticed is that people jump, 
they throw away all the inputs and only give you the output. Your, the strategy mm. statement or planning statement is a set of artifacts, like a set of decks or whatever that are presented at a big meeting and say, we're done, this is the planning. None of the inputs, none of the discussions, the assumptions, the beliefs, what you're trying to do is you're trying to improve your decision quality over time. And to, re to improve your decision quality, you need to be able to review your inputs. Mm. And that's very important because next year in six months, things just might go to shit and you made all the right assumptions and right beliefs and right decisions. And therefore I would argue that the planning process and the strategy process was good because mm. the inputs were right. It's just the macro factors made it very difficult to do that. So number one is to kind of measure what you're doing. Maybe it is a little bit hands in the air. The best bet is to do a retrospective about four to six months into the year, review all the assumptions and beliefs that went into this particular direction you're taking and then sort of assess at that point, like, did we get it right? And just things didn't work out where it was. What were our beliefs? Did that belief hold? And that's probably, it is qualitative, but that's probably the most effective way you can do it. The next part is evaluating whether are you are quote unquote executing on the strategy. And this is the problem mm -hmm. is I think most companies spend 90% of their time thinking about, did you execute on the strategy? And only 10% thinking about, was it the right strategy? And did we go Good. in with the right assumptions? Yeah. <laughs> so not that we should delve too deeply into this 90%, but I think largely there, it's just, did we execute on this particular strategy? I think that's kind of a covered topic. You know, people are like, you know, did we achieve the outcomes we did? Did we do? But notice what I'm saying. There's 10% is, was it the right goal? 90% is, did we hit the goal? You need to flip that around. Right. Maybe yeah. like 60% should be, did we come up with the right goal? And 40% mm. did be, did we, you know, exceed the goal or not? So just, you need to flip the script if that yeah, makes yeah. any sense. Yeah, I, lo I love that. What, um, and I, I especially love your call out on that, uh, even when reviewing the strategy, we always like reviewing the outputs of the strategy, not the inputs and assumptions that go into that. Uh, how have you, like, what other, in, like, what are the core inputs you see that go into um, yeah, informing the product strategy? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you could use many, you know, I like um, Richard Rommel, you know, these are your diagnosis, um, you know, what, what are the sort of, what was your diagnosis of the situation? And then what are some of the kernels of understanding that you had that you brought away from that? You know, you did mm. these things. So I think that the ultimate guidance here is what were your assumptions? What data were you operating under? What key decisions did you need to make? Mm. And what decision did you make? What information did you have going into making that decision? What is this, what was the right decision to be able to do? And like I said, you know, most companies, you end up seeing this deck with three pillars on it. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess what decisions went into that? And right. no one really remembers that. So even if you just listed your facts, assumptions, your beliefs, the key decisions you made, what was your diagnosis of the situation at the time? And importantly, what were the things that you agreed that were not important? You notice how most strategies mm. are just basically all the things and plans are like, here's what our priorities are, not what your right. non-priorities are. Meanwhile, right. you find that 40% of the company is still working on the non-priorities and not right. getting any love from the company. It's just like, these are our new priorities in addition yeah. <laughs> to yeah. the old things that we are doing. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the inputs. Like it doesn't take a lot. It could be like one or two pages of a document written covering your assumptions and your beliefs and the kind of non-priorities and what your take on the situation was. And then that yeah. gives you an artifact to be able to go back later and say like, let's look at this now with new eyes uh, to see right. how we yeah. can. Yeah, that's great. Uh, all right, I uh, I think I want to make sure we get uh, some questions from our audience as well. So I'd love I'll give to... you quick answers too. I'm not good at quick answers, but I'll give you like 30 second answers. There no, 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 no. We, we can we can like, if, if, if it's a, if it's a question that warrants a detailed answer, we can we can do that. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, if you can have the the first question uh, from the audience. What uh, so this one. Uh, so mm. Michael Newton, what tools, process, methods have you seen work to increase the shared coherence across teams? Yeah. So I'll give you a couple. So you need to hit different senses that people have. Not everyone responds to like a list of facts or list of data. So for example, mm -hmm. storytelling, can you tell the story of the vision you're trying to create? You know, that's very salient. Some people respond a lot to stories. So an example there is, you know, by the end of the following year, what new stories do we hope to be telling about our customers and how they're using the product, how they're doing that particular thing? Um, second, um, 
crystal clear, non-fluffy statements. So, hmm. you know, typically yeah. what happens is, is that someone's like, um, you know, delight our customers. And 70% yeah. of the people in the room are just like, <laughs> and 30% of the people are like, yeah, yeah, delight our customers. So anytime you can unpack that, you do your team right. a huge favor by unpacking fluffy statements. Um, right. The third thing that I would say is, you know, obviously this is a classic one or pre-mortems, you know, you project yourself a year in advance, you kind of, um, you, you unravel the year as it progressed. What I would say as a general principle is to create shared coherence, you need to tap into people's different styles, different perceptions. Some people are solution oriented and that's their superpower. Some people are more strategy oriented and that's their superpower. Some people want to sit in and like clearly understand problems. That's their superpower. Some people don't want to worry about that too much and like love to operate, love to deliver. So when you're trying to create that shared understanding of the team, you can't just rely on one person's method for solving problems or for talking about strategy. You need to create, you need to embrace a lot of diversity in terms of yeah. how people approach these problems. The final activity you can do, which is the most fun is um, there's two. You can ask the question to the team, um, what are, what are words that we use often that seem to just confuse people? Just that simple mm. question. And whenever I've done this activity with teams, they'll say quality, delight, minimally viable product um, at, at amplitude, you know, a late majority customers, just the word maturity, maturity. Yeah. You know, all these words confuse the crap out of people, yet we use them more and more and more and more. Yeah. So you could do that simple activity. But the cool thing is you decide on one of three things. One, we must agree on a definition. Two, mm. it's okay if we have different definitions, just as long as we know what other people are thinking. And then the third is basically just trying to define it will take the life out of it. So trying mm. to define quality is a losing game. Everyone wants to define it, but when you try to define it, you actually take the, the, the sort of the, the variety out of it. So that's a, a clear activity you could do with your team to do it. Yeah. That's great. Uh, love, love the, the activity. I think I want to do it myself and end up it. Um, <laughs> Are we going to have the next question up? Voice of customer. Just kidding. Um, All right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, are there any are concrete there... measures? Uh, are there any yeah. concrete measures you could suggest for judging quality of strategic inputs? I guess we should define quality here. So yeah. perhaps something like stating confidence uh, at the time it was made and then looking at which ones worked out in comparison to your past confidence. Uh, that's actually very Yeah, I think you have the right track there. You're on the right track. And I think that this idea of stating things too with confidence intervals or other things are very interesting. So you'll notice that sometimes, you know, here's the classic example. I love they ask that question. You're looking at a slide and it's got three pillars on it and they all look the same. Meanwhile, one is an emerging bet. No one knows anything to do with it. Very like mm. very high confidence that an opportunity exists, but actually not a lot of confidence in terms of the confidence interval that you know how to solve it at that point. So, you know, the opportunity is big, questionable whether you can capture that opportunity. Right. The third statement on the slide is basically like the tried and true part of the business. We're going to run this every day. The trains are going to run on time. Very, very high confidence, but maybe the opportunity size is more known and smaller. So it's like, this is reliably an eight, um, it's or seven, it's not a 10. And we have a pretty good confidence that the world is going to continue running. So that I love that question because it talks about grading the strategic, the inputs going into it. But this has to do with how you present your strategy too. Notice how many companies present all three pillars at the same level without high confidence, yes. yeah. low confidence, or emerging idea and solid idea. Um, yeah. And so this is like, a, you could just do that right now. I love that. I didn't probably answer the question, but it just sparked another idea that like talking about your confidence around these assumptions, I'll leave you with one more is the difference between an assumption to test and an operating assumption. Mm. So lots of teams this time of year, they're like, but we don't know about that. Now leader one is like, yes, I know you don't know about it, but I want you to operate under the idea that we do know about it. Leader mm. number two is basically like, yeah, we don't know anything about it. We're going to need to run lots of tests to learn about it. Lead, leader number three is kind of like, <laughs> and so the difference is like an operating assumption is an assumption that you're going to operate under the understanding that you might have the answer. An assumption to test is something that like you're going to actively go and learn about it. Now right. you're going to learn either way, but do you see the difference there? Like these these differences mean a massive amount with planning and how you talk yeah. about what you're doing. 
yeah that's that's a very good uh, clarification there on that yeah yeah what Varun, um, what what uh, what's interpret what's your big operating assumption uh, i will tell that in private on <laughs> 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 the live stream but i have we have a few yeah <laughs> uh, great. oh man we're, we're almost at time um so um Thank you, John, for joining. I mean, I, I can sure. talk to you for hours uh, discussing any <laughs> specific topic. It's always such a pleasure. Uh, but I really enjoyed uh, talking and just diving into the specifics and un unraveling, unpacking like product planning. Uh, yeah. So thank you for joining. Thank you everyone for joining. So uh, it was very insightful. We obviously uh, have this recorded and share snippets of this, so uh, you can re-listen and re-watch it again and you know learn again from the master that is Mr. John Carson. So John, thank you once again for having us. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Talk to you soon. Yeah. yeah. All right. See you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>